the Wednesday, August 5th, 2020 virtual special meeting slash workshop of the town of Scarborough, Maine um, town council. Uh, item number two is the Pledge of Allegiance. I will have a flag up here momentarily. I pledge allegiance to, to the flag America, of the United, United States, States of America, America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I wouldn't, wasn't sure if we could get through that without Jean Marie leading the way. Yes, <laughs> it's hard to tell who's leading the way on when you're on Zoom. You hear different people chime in at different times. Uh, Tom, you want to do the roll call? Certainly. Councillor Gleistein. Here. Councillor Hamill. Here. Councillor Hayes. Here. Councillor Johnson. Here. Councillor Clucci. Here. Chairman Johnson. Here. And I believe uh, Councillor Katarina uh, has been excused this evening. Um, item number four is, um, this is framed as a special meeting, but essentially that's because we have an executive session at the end. So this is essentially a, a um, non-action item workshop. It's the workshop regarding the Little Dolphin Credit Enhancement Agreement for the Affordable Housing Project. I think more specifically, Jocelyn Place. Um, I think before we get started, Tom, I'm going to let you do the introductions, but I, I'm just going to start with a quick timeline for everybody. Uh, just to make sure those, I know some people in the public are just joining in and, oops, I did not want to share this, excuse me. So just real quick, a quick timeline for members of the public and for us to refresh where we are. Uh, prior to July 15th, I believe the project has satisfied all planning board approval. I'll let Tom correct me if I'm wrong on that. Mm -hmm. um, on July 15th, this council met for a preliminary workshop. On July 22nd, there was a meeting of the Scarborough Housing Alliance, which some of the same members that are with us today uh, met with the Scarborough Housing Alliance. Uh, August 5th is today. This is our follow-up workshop on the project. Uh, and then we are expected and slated to have our first reading on August 19th, which I believe will be our first meeting that will be back in person meeting. We are planning to meet in person. Uh, and on September 2nd, if necessary, there will be a public hearing. And lastly, the second reading is scheduled for September 16th. So I just put a little context for those of you watching on YouTube slash us to bring us up to speed. Um, and Tom, I'll let you, you're much better at introductions than I am. Certainly. I tend to just to jump in and ignore the people on accident. So please. <laughs> Certainly. Uh, so as uh, the chairman postured, uh, this is a follow-up workshop. Uh, many of the same folks are part of this, uh, this, this discussion tonight. Uh, we have invited the town attorney, Shauna Cook-Mueller, to join us. Uh, she has been working and actually the chief author of the draft credit enhancement agreement. So she's certainly available to answer any questions you may have there. And then on behalf of the development team, we have Mike Hulsey. Mike is the executive director of the South Portland uh, Housing Authority and possibly also the development corporation. I'll let him correct me if I'm wrong. Right. And then uh, his consultant, Jim Demesis, is here. Uh, uh, as well as a resource. So um, as a follow-up to the July 15th workshop, there were a number of questions. I think Chairman Johnson encouraged counselors to pose questions, uh, which many of you did. I believe we had a total of 27 that were generated. And we did circulate a, a Q&A document that was part of the meeting agenda um, to, to address many of those. There's a couple of lingering ones that are still in process that I'm sure will talk about. In fact, I'd like to get some further direction on at least one of those. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll turn it back to you. Okay, great. Um, before we go any further, I think for simplicity, um, I'm going to take public comment now. Just, just I know this workshop, we actually were not on a timeline with this workshop. We typically are. So if there, I guess I'll do two places for public comment. I'll ask for it now and I'll do, I'll ask for it afterwards as well. I have two emails I'll read into the record. Um, I'll do that afterwards, but if there's anybody that was that's watching that is here specifically to make a comment and then I wanted to give the opportunity to do that if you wanted to comment and then leave the meeting if you had some other plans. So if there's anybody that would like to make any comments, which I don't think there is. Um, so I will read the two emails after the workshop. Uh, before the the my quick idea for the workshop is I was going to um, quasi quickly read our FAQs, our questions and our answers. 
Um, I would read those primarily and project those for the public so they can see them and then have that be our discussion point if any of us have follow up questions to those FAQs. Uh, there's a lot of them. So I think as a council, if we feel like we can cut bait on some of them or we're satisfied, let's just let's just burn right through them. That's not saying that we're limiting this workshop whatsoever to those those questions. I just think it was a, it's a good place to start because I do believe um, staff and and I believe had some help. It's just there's a lot of good information there. So I think it will frame the question easily. Um, before I jump into that, though, Mike, could you just do us a favor? I think a lot of our questions are um, the relationship just essentially the, the and I have an organization chart that I could probably project as as you're giving us the organization of um, the deal, so to speak. But I think I personally I've been there's been confusion on, you know, currently does um, the the downs folks own the land? Are they selling the land to you? Are they building the building? And then once the organization who owns it and operates it moving forward, I think that will just help with the context. And then I'll just I'll make my way through the FAQs and let me know if you would like me to share the organization chart because I have. Hi, you're certainly welcome to share the organizational okay. chart. Uh, yes. And uh, thanks for letting me be here tonight. And I do wish Brooks was here. He's the more technical person, but I do think I can answer your questions. And if I can't, I'll certainly defer any to later. But with that said, the uh, yeah, they currently own the land now. Uh, and part of our agreement with them is once we get the municipal approvals um, and, and get um, basically get through this process with the town of Scarborough, then we'll be purchasing the land from them. And we will then own it 100%, or I should say the Oak Hill Senior Housing Limited Partnership will own the land 100%. Okay. And as far as, are they building the structure for you guys? Is that part of the- No, agreement? no, there, there's no involvement with them after that. I mean, except for the fact that we'll have some, um, you know, they'll have some input on the, on the, you know, the, the parking lot, which has already gone through planning board approval, the, you know, the common areas, if you will. And after the building's built, we probably will have some common maintenance of the parking lot. If you can imagine snow plowing, you know, we're not gonna have two different companies plow the driveway for the parking lot. So there'll be some shared costs with them, but that's the only, only thing going forward that we'll have with the with with the seller. So when you when you reference that, I'm assuming they're going to do that through like their main properties LLC or what whatever their property management company typically is that plows yep. that area. Is that what yeah, you're or, or you know we'll or maybe we'll do it too. Uh, you know we okay. manage all of our properties. We do all of our, all of our own plowing. So um, I don't know if that's been arranged yet, but certainly certainly we'll look at that. Okay. Is there? I'll yield to any other counselor. Does anybody want to ask Mike any follow up questions before we get to the FAQs? Betsy? Yep, Betsy, can you hear me? Yes, sorry. Good. Um, so hi guys, I did get a chance to talk to Brooks. Um, and so, uh, you know, he, he gave me lots of great information and it is, it's a, it's a pretty complex financial arrangement that you guys enter into in order to, uh, to make these, these projects happen. Mm -hmm. um, so I think some of the questions we've seen from the public um, I'm not really going to, I might try to say what my understanding is, but the limited partnership is a partnership that you form with your fine, the people who will finance this. And you don't know exactly who that will be until the project goes further along. Is that correct? Or so like Brooks explained to me, um, one time part one of your partner LP was mutual of Omaha. Another time it might be a conglomeration of banks. Um, it's a, it, it depends on um, who buys the investment on the, the checks credit market. So is that something that will be happening in the future? Because some folks have asked who are these limited partners and do you know now? And if you don't know now, when, when will you know? Well, we don't, we don't know now. And, um, you know, we'll certainly go out and shop around for those limited partners that will pay the, you know, the, the most amount of money towards the, you know, towards the credits for us that will put more money into the project. Uh, you you named some of the limited partners that we worked with for TD banks, another one that we worked with before, um, you know, oftentimes, um, you know, it, it's just, it's, an, it's a, it's a group of uh, banks and financial institutions, insurance companies that, you know, it, you know, invest in these properties to get the tax credits. Um, so we don't know who they are now. We, we, we would know after we were awarded the uh, tax credits to main housing, then we would actually lock that in. 
Right. Okay. Yeah, that was my understanding. It's sort of a financial instrument on the uh, on that a broker helps you find um, partners who are interested in your That's particular correct. project. Yeah, and you know, and also, you know, the investors really look at us to make sure that we're strong and we have a good history of, of projects like this, which we do. And we have good management history, and you know, we've received good scores from you know whether it's main housing or anybody else who, or other investors who have looked at our projects and we get audited regularly. So we have a good track record. So, you know, we're considered to be a good investment. So um, that helps us with our experience. I agree. I hope that answered for those folks who are listening that who the LPs, who the LP partners are, um, what it is, but then specifically who it will be, will be known um, if you get the award. Absolutely. Yep. Anybody else? Any questions for Mike before we jump into the uh, Don? So this this may be a good time to ask the M and R um, uh, relationship here. As I understand it, M and R Holdings or Rosvera entity is selling the land, and also is it, you expect they'll be the builder, but they don't they don't show up anywhere on this chart. Is that right? I mean they they won't be appearing as a as a limited partner or or in some other form as an entity on um, this capitalization chart. No, they, they're not, they, they will not be involved at all once we own the once we acquire the land from them you know it's uh, we'll be moving forward you know ourselves without them at all they're responsible they'll be responsible for developing another building on the site but that's that they'll have nothing to do with us and they'll have nothing to do with this project great Thanks very much. You're welcome. Mike, Mike, when you say the other building on the site, are you just are you referencing the potential thirty thousand? The potential building, building? Yes, the, the potential. I know it's their desire to build another office building on the site. I think if you watched the planning board meetings, you saw the location of that building. Yeah, and and just again, I think I know the answer, but I'm trying to get out to the yep. public. That thirty thousand building square foot building is not involved whatsoever with this CEA that we're discussing. It's not at all. Yeah. Not at I mean, all. Would you would you guys utilize that for your own office space or no. is that no? Okay. No. We, we will have an office inside this, uh, you know, our, our our residential building, a single office to meet with residents, um, you know, and there'll also be community space in there too. But yeah, no. That's helpful. Thank you. Any others? Just I I know I think many of us haven't necessarily touched space in this last week. We've been we've been laying a little bit lower. Is everybody comfortable with me flying through the FAQs with the understanding that some we might follow up in, some we won't? I think that's probably the best way to. Okay, so I'll do that, and then Sean. After that, I plan on we'll open up questions specifically to the draft CEA, so we can we can get to you. So I apologize for the hour that you might have to sit through. <laughs> <laughs> Not that it's not going to be super informative, just that you have to, that it's not your world, so to speak. Um, okay, I am going to project our FAQs on the screen. Can everybody see those okay? I'm going to assume yes. Um, okay, question number one was, what is the structure of the corporate ownership of the project? Assuming that SPHDC is the general partner of the limited liability ability, excuse me, owning the building, who are the limited partners? I believe off the top we have answered that. I going to ex just quickly, if anybody wants to interject, I'm not going to read the rest simply because I think we have answered that. Number two is uh, in the proposed real estate transaction, who will own the land on which the project is built? Does the SPHDC or an affiliate have an option to purchase the land? If so, what are the terms of that agreement? Um, and the answer is the land will be owned by the limited partnership for a minimum of 15 years. At the end of the 15 year period, the SPHDC will have an option to purchase the land and buildings. The terms of the sale are negotiated at the end of the 15 year compliance period. In some cases, the land and buildings are purchased outright by the, out, outright by the general partner. In other cases, the, the project reapplies uh, to the LIHTC program in order to make repairs and improvements to the property. Once tax, sorry, I'm going to make this bigger for everybody. Once tax credits are received, a new limited partnership is formed for an additional 15 years. In either event, the property must be maintained as affordable housing for 45 years. So I'll pause right there. Are there any clarify? I believe any questions for that would probably go towards Mike, right? Is there any questions? No. no? 
Any questions from us? Yep, Betsy. Mike, that, that 45 years, that's because of the main housing tax credits? That yeah, that's, that's correct. That's, that's the, okay. And another follow-up is our initial CA, and, and forgive me because I actually haven't looked at it yet, not that it's, I'm sure it's great, but it's 27 years or 28 years simply because of the life of our TIF district right now. Is that correct? Shauna, do you want to answer that? I think that might be a Yes, the, the um, credit enhancement agreement is meant to run on for to match the rest of the term of the district that's existing. And one way to kind of get a visual of that is to look at the projections that were part of the council packet um, towards the end. Um, and it'll show you that the first year of the credit enhancement agreement would be 2021, 2022. And that would be the third year of the 30 year downtown on the best TIF district. Good, thank you. Is there any other follow-up? I'm trying to pull that up that she just referenced, so apologies. Mike, I guess it doesn't really matter, but I, I, I still am struggling with the um, SPDHC versus the South Portland Housing Authority. So um, the development corporation would actually own the land, not the South Portland Housing Authority, but South Portland Housing Authority is going to manage the property. Is that, is that how correct. that works? That's correct. And with all of our projects are structured this way, uh, other than our traditional public housing, which is hasn't been built since the 80s. Um, yeah, the Development Corp is the general partner, or it's a single member of an LLC that's general partner, just for legal purposes. Um, and uh, of course, the partnership, we have the general partner and the, and the limited partners. Um, and yeah, um, the SPHA has all the employees. That's our management company. So, you know, that's basically what manages, you know, our properties for us. And we get paid a, a small man. All of you guys work for SPHA, right? That's correct. As far as how our payroll is paid out. And I apologize for the lag, but I'll just I'll just put this up to Sean uh, just for reference. This is what I Shauna, this is what you were referencing, I believe, correct? Yes. Yeah. So if we look here, the TIF year three and four are essentially empty, so to speak, um, and then it goes on through only year thirty. So. And just uh, my apologies, I'm trying my best to click and share and look smooth all at the same time. Uh, question number three is how many parking spaces are part of the project in addition of the vehicle tra uh, vehicular, vehicular traffic associated with the project consistent with a comprehensive plan? Um, and answer is A, the site plan includes 61 parking spaces. The SPHDC requires that each resident with a car obtain a free parking permit. B, the senior housing land use is very low traffic generator. It is likely it is the lowest traffic generator of all the uses allowed in the zoning district. A traffic assessment was done by TY Lynn International Traffic Engineer Tom uh, Erico. Um, and he stated the project is not expected to generate a significant amount of traffic and is below the town's threshold of 35 trips to warrant a full traffic study. This level of trip generation would not be expected to create any mobility or safety problems. And I'll pause right there. And does anybody, I, any follow up? I'm guessing we go towards Tom on this one. Does anybody have any follow ups for Tom on the question of the traffic? Don? Uh, Tom, I, I I don't really know what, you know, what, what's uh, considered a high impact or not, but so the 35 trips, so it's that one, a little more than one trip per car per day, right? Is that, that's kind of the assumption here. And then I saw some figures later on said that, that the impact fees for, for that would be somewhere in the neighborhood of 15,000. So can you give us an idea of how, you know, how to equate those numbers? Because I, you know, there's, I know there's a lot of perceptions that, you know, our impact fees are, you know, too high according to some, too low according to others. So thanks. Well, and Tom, as you answer, I'll just keep this sure. on the Perfect, thank you. Uh, you know, this is certainly the realm and domain of the planning board. Uh, incidentally, this project did get final site plan approval, I think earlier this week. Is that right, Mike? Yes. Monday. Monday. Yep. Um, and as was mentioned in the in the response to the question, uh, our site plan uh, ordinance uh, does have certain thresholds. Uh, and in this case, 
for traffic uh, if a project does not generate more than 35 trips during peak uh, PM and, and AM hours, it does not require a full traffic study. Now, having said that, uh, they did engage uh, one of the best traffic engineers in the state, Tom Errico, uh, to do some traffic modeling. And we do have a, a number of different uh, traffic impact fees. Uh, those are specific to certain intersections. And as you see on this slide that's up on the screen, this project impacts uh, four different intersections that have impact fees associated with them. So that's a distinction that perhaps isn't appreciated not all of our uh, intersections have impact fees. And so uh, it's only those intersections that do and only impact on those for which uh, a fee is paid. And you'll see the breakdown uh, in terms of uh, where we expect the traffic will go and what the impact fees uh, paid for the project are. I'll, I'll stop there, Don. I'm not sure if I answered your question. I'm pleased to follow up. That's great, and I'm not trying to suggest I'm, you know, going to pursue a career as a traffic engineer someday. Mm -hmm. But can you give us an idea of what the factors are? You know, is it is it pavement? Is it density? You know, what are do you have an idea of what what the factors are for why certain intersections? I mean, Hygus was, you know, higher than than Oak Hill. Yeah, does, can you give us any insight there? Well, I. I in terms of why we chose to have impact fees on certain intersections and not others? Is that your question? What the factors are driving the, the costs for the, uh, you know, how we calculate the impact fees. And this may be more detailed. Okay. Yeah, no, no, sure. No, that's a, uh, it's a good question. Um, impact fees are highly regulated under state statute. And so uh, first off, when we collect them, we need to make certain that we use them for the purpose for which it's collected. Uh, these are not fictitious numbers. Uh, these are based on actual designs for improvements to intersections, and then they allocate, uh, based on the total cost of that improvement, uh, a per trip cost, if you will. And that's why you see them vary widely among the different intersections, because they're different improvements at different costs. Uh, that's typically the way that it works, and we amass these funds, and then at some future date, we'll do a municipal project using these funds to make that improvement when the need is there. And the, bat, the theory of all of this is that no single project, in, unless it's huge, uh, you know, is enough to, to make an intersection fail, but it's the cumulative effect and it's a drip, drip, drip that over time creates a failing situation. And so this is a mechanism whereby we identify an improvement, we collect funds to be able to fund that improvement, and we do it when it's necessary, not before. Um, there's one exception to that rule uh, the town did advance monies and made improvements to the Hygus Parkway Route 1 intersection, right where Holy Donut is. Uh, so we advanced the money and arguably did that improvement before it was required. And so we're collecting fees to pay our debt service off. That's the one exception. And we did that one because it was related to the Dunstan improvements we made further down Route 1. Great. So that's a bit in the weeds, but that's that's kind of the background. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Any more? So I, uh, Tom and Mike and maybe Jim, I'm going to let you guys just answer this next one verbally. It's a very long written answer, and I think it'd make more sense for the audience and us for you guys just to maybe regurgitate it. So I apologize for asking it twice. Um, how did the town determine that a 75% tax rebate was appropriate for the project rather than say 50% or 100%? And I, again, I, not, no disrespect to the written answer because it's very helpful, but I think me reading that quickly is not going to do anybody any favors. So if, <laughs> does anybody want to chime in with the answer to that or give us some insight to it? Or I could read it, but. <laughs> I can start and, and yeah. it will be rudimentary. I'm sure Jim or, or Mike can fill in. There's, <clears throat> I, I can't justify the, 50, the 75%, but what I can tell you is that uh, this serves two purposes for the project. One, obviously the larger the reimbursement for property tax relief, uh, helps the financials of the project and help the, help the operations, if you will. Uh, more important than that, I suspect, is the fact that Maine Housing uh, sees the value of other sources of funds for a project so their funds can be used elsewhere. And they prioritize that by way of assigning um, incentives through their point system. And so the higher percentage credit enhancement agreement arrangement garners higher points. And these are highly competitive um, applications for access to 
to the tax credits. Uh, and so, uh, you know, points matter. And so I, I think there's two, two, two values. One is the operational savings and two is, uh, is the points. And I'll let them speak to why it's 75 as opposed to something else. Sure, and I'll, I'll kind of just re-say what Tom said, but maybe in a little bit different way. You know, main housing, um, you know, they give points for, for, you know, projects like this that get these tax breaks, if you will. And the reality is it does help the financials of the project. It, it lowers our operating expenses. And you might say, well, geez, that means you're going to have you know more money. Well, actually not, because what Maine Housing will then do is they will give us less subsidy for the project. So in other words, we will reduce our operating costs because of this, uh, this TIF arrangement. Uh, we can then take on more debt and they, have to, they can then give us less subsidy than they can use for other projects. That's why they reward projects with points, you know, to get funded if they have these types of arrangements. Um, so basically what I'm trying to say is main housing is, is basically the entity that benefits the most from this. Um, you know, it might be a net result of zero for us because we have a lowering operating costs, but we're going to take on more debt. So we're going to have more interest and in, uh, interest in, in debt service. Uh, the reason why the 75% is because that's where we, we, we get more points with 75% than we do with 50% and that those points are very, very valuable for us to get this project funded. Main housing looks at this as, as you know, all so seeing that the community is involved in this and the community supports the projects and, and recognizes the need for affordable housing. So, you know, it's kind of a twofold there, but, um, you know, that's kind of my simple answer. Uh, yeah, so this was, this was very interesting uh, to me because um, I downloaded the, the uh, point scale. It's pretty easy to understand. And um, one of the things that, that Brooks um, might have said, <laughs> Had he been here, I'm not speaking for Brooks, but I guess on your side, you guys are looking for every point that you can find, every right? Point. Because you're, if, if you're, you're filling out applications and you're doing everything to get every single point because it's a very competitive process to get the tax credits. Correct. Um, I guess where my questions came in um, were more for the town. Uh, so when you look at the point scale, um, you're going for three points because the only way to get four points is to get a 75% rebate for 30 years. If you, uh, to get three points, you, you can go less than 30 years, but you have to get the 75%. But you can also get three points at 50% rebate from the town with a 30 year tip. So, at this point, we don't have a 30 year because you came into our existing downtown TIF instead of creating an affordable housing TIF. You know, and I did kind of want to explain um, to the public since you know, there was um, a, a bit of uh, acrimonious um, comments made at the last meeting by other counselors that um, I, I looked at this as saying, oh, okay, here's someone who wants to do something under our economic development TIF. So I know all about economic development tips because I got all um, knowledgeable about those with the most recent one we did and the downs and all of that. And so I just immediately put that into that category because that's the way that it came through. And kind of as we went forward, I guess, uh, became clear that uh, we didn't really want to consider this project as that. And yet we were not coming under an affordable um, housing tip, which is what um, I think when I asked Brooks, he said that's normally the way that um, these projects go through. And I think if we look at what we've done in our town, we normally do an affordable housing TIF. So I guess my question is to Tom, why um, when this project's been known for a long time, there was time to get a TIF through. They've, they've been, they've come, they came to us quite some time ago um, to, to, uh, to uh, tell us they were interested in doing this. Um, why, why didn't we go for creating an affordable housing TIF? Because under that, um, we could have done a 50% rebate and they still could have gotten three points for their project. Um, as it is, unless we give 75% now, because the term of the TIF is, if we're going into is only 27 years, that if we went with 50%, the best that they could do is two points on that point scale. So I, I guess I'm not quite clear why the town decided to drive this through the economic development TIF. 
Um, it's, it kind of seems like almost like a giveaway because they could have gotten what they wanted. We could have like um, given a lesser rebate. Uh, so I, that's, that's um, what I'm trying to understand is why we didn't go through the paperwork uh, and create the TIF. And I'll just make one more comment on that. I think the affordable housing TIFs are a good opportunity um, to have them go to the housing line. It's a good opportunity for the town to really think about the vision around affordable housing, how much we want, um, what we're doing, what the, the, big, the big picture plan is. I think um, this one kind of just coming through and just asking for a CEA, you know, I know at least for me personally, it kind of, kind of caught me off guard um, because it, it's a little bit different from the other um, CEAs that have been considered by the town under the, under the downtown tip. Well, first and foremost, uh, we saw this as a way, well, first and foremost, I'm not aware that we've had any other requests for affordable housing TIFs in an area that was already covered uh, within the TIF district. That's a distinction that's different. And quite simply, uh, with that knowledge, it, it made sense. And, and frankly, we had to do some checking with both DCD and Maine Housing as to whether or not we could pursue this route. Shauna and, uh, and I think Jim both collaborated on understanding that piece. Um, but we saw it as a way to achieve all of the public policy goals that you articulated in terms of advancing affordable housing uh, without the additional challenge of needing to modify the existing omnibus downtown TIF by carving this lot out and then creating a new one specifically for this lot. Um, I thought that would be easier to work within uh, the confines of the existing system. I guess the last piece I would say is that this is a shorter term by three years than what uh, would be otherwise. And I think that's in the town's best interest. So was is there just a lack of understanding of the points? Because the big difference I can see is that they could have gotten three points and the town could have only rebated 50%, not 75%. And as I, Brooks had explained to me and Mike just explained, financially it doesn't really matter to them because it, it goes back. <laughs> They, they, have, they can only make 1.5% above their operating costs no matter what. So, um, you know, so I guess I, I'm not quite understanding why the town would, um, when there was time to create a TIF, now we're being told there's not time to approve this within a TIF, which might mean, you know, maybe, hey, let's slow down and get it into a TIF, an affordable housing TIF, so we can give you the whole 30 years at 50%. Um, and, uh, you know, then we've saved the taxpayers some money, we've achieved the points. Um, so I guess, was there just not an understanding of that or, because the loser there seems to be the extra 25% that, that, um, the, that the state of Maine is not going to end up financing because um, we're going to, you know, we're being asked for 75% for just a, a little bit of a shorter term, a three-year TIF. Well, keep in mind, those three years are at the highest value as well. So um, it'd be interesting to run the financials to see how that runs out. Um, but I think that's a meaningful point here. Uh, certainly, we could have done that. I could predict that we would have been met with a, a similar discussion. Why not work within the existing system? And uh, I guess you can certainly hold me responsible, but I was trying to make it uh, easier for the town in that regard. Shauna, I don't know if you have anything further to add in that regard. Um, I don't think so. I mean, I think just so so folks have an understanding, it's definitely been done a number of times across the state where there's been an existing district in place through DECD and an affordable housing project comes forward and, and with a CEA proposal um, and will kind of have an option. You know, you can do the two application step um, process where you're creating a new affordable housing TIF district or what is, you know, much easier and sort of was part of um, the kind of options that we created or that the council created in the original designation of the downtown omnibus district to be able to simply have council process through which you can authorize a credit enhancement agreement with the same you know, result. Yeah. Um, but I understand what you're saying about the points. Um, I, you know, um, my understanding was that there is two motivators, you know, that the financials are part of the, the request and as well as the points. Um, so I don't know if that's helpful, but that's my two cents. John, do you have something? And then Peter after John. Yeah, I, I, but I'll sit, I'll hold. No, I said John. I'm sorry, John. Sorry. 
Yeah. yeah, that's okay. Um, no, I was just going to say, Betsy, there's an offset as well. When you're comparing the 50% versus 75%, some of the rationale for giving a CEA is that there's a, a reimbursement from the state through revenue sharing and our school funding formula. And um, that's based on the capture rate. So it, if we have a higher capture rate, 78% um, with the way it's structured now, we're going to get a bigger reimbursement from the state. So I think, like Tom said, when you run the numbers, there's probably not as big of a difference between the two to the taxpayer as, as you might think at first. I totally agree with you, John. Um, in Portland, they do a very complex tax shift calculation mm -hmm. to show exactly what that shift is. Um, it's a very, uh, it's, it's helpful to see it. Here's the tax shift, we do this, but then this is what it's gonna offset from the county, from the school. And then there's a few other things they calculate into it. Um, and uh, I think, you know, and I think that Tom had a, a good point. I do think running those numbers, you know, would make sense, you know, to me to say, you know, or, or, you know, we just say, well, let's do it at, let's do it at 50% and you only get two points. Um, we're not obligated to try to get there and, and hopefully the project, you know, still goes forward. But I think that those, um, those calculations would be um, of interest. And I think going forward, if we can develop that methodology of what that tax shifting looks like, John, I think that would be a value uh, for projects like this going forward. Yeah, I agree. And I just want to add, I, I asked this with the last workshop that um, I, I believe it's already too late to do a house in an affordable housing TIF to make this cycle. Um, I think that this would have been done a few yeah. months ago. Yeah. I think when it first came, it might not have been too late, but I think it's too late for this cycle. Yeah. Just to be clear, we do, uh, it's required through the creation of a TIF, we do the tax shift calculation. It's a, it's a requirement of, of the application. So that is done as a normal procedure. The difference here is that uh, that was done with the omnibus TIF district. Um, and then oh, this is okay. simply this is simply a CA, CAA, CEA under your authority to grant. So it's not required as part of the submission. There's no submission to, to Maine Housing or DCD for that matter. Right, so which again, just kind of puts this in a little bit of a strange category. You know, I know um, Shana said, you know, it's done frequently, but I think I think it's it's more common, right? It's the most common to do it under an affordable housing tip. Is that correct? I'm sure, I'm, I'm sure that's the case. And that's how we've done the two previous ones. Again, the difference being there was a pre-existing TIF district that consumed this lot, included this lot. Peter? You're muted. You know, for me, I think Betsy raises a great point. It's been sort of a reoccurring theme for me. I think uh, I've listened to the rationale, but I think it would have been really helpful for our process if we had actually seen, you know, gee, yeah, maybe maybe it's 30 years versus 27. But what does that really mean in dollars? And, and I think we should have at least had some information about what would a 50 percent if, if it doesn't make any difference to the scoring and any difference to the likelihood of the project, you know, we should know what that number, that differential is. And maybe as John suggests and others, it's purely insignificant. But I mean, at three years, the difference between 25% of the total tax revenues versus 50%, that's not an insignificant number. And, and I think the fact that we don't know it I, I'm concerned that we're just not doing due diligence. We're not following our fiduciary responsibility to make sure we're making the best decisions for the taxpayers. So um, I don't know if it's easy to get those numbers. It should be real easy to calculate off that sheet, but I'd be interested in seeing what is the difference. And I don't know what that means for timing. Maybe it falls out of this year's cycle, but it certainly can be part of next year's cycle if, that's, if we decide that that's a better financial arrangement for taxpayers. So I just think as we look at these things, these are critical pieces of information that we should have as a council to make informed decisions. So I echo what Betsy says. I, I, I think we can dismiss it as being not very material, but what's that based on? I, you know, we should have some numbers to look at. So I'll, I'll, that's my point here. My point later will be on the financial analysis. We just need to know what is 
what is it, what's in it for the town? What is the cost of the town to do this? And that is, is it a good decision for our community? So without information, that's really hard to do. Don? Yeah, one, one piece of data that might be helpful, uh, additional data is, uh, I'm guessing there's costs associated with creating a new TIF, with creating, you know, an affordable housing TIF. I don't know what that would be, but, but uh, you know, if, if those are not insignificant, they probably ought to be included in that, in that calculation as well. So I, that I don't, I'm guessing illegal fees, obviously, but I don't know what else. Yeah, well, I think also to John's point, I mean, it is really nuanced because we are talking about we, in theory, we want to capture as much value as possible in that, in the TIF district, right? So I think, you know, when we're looking at our spreadsheets, we're looking at a lot of the stuff in a vacuum and we're not necessarily looking at how it interacts with, you know, I, John has beat this drum a few times and I think he's spot on. If we do this TIF, TIF, just TIF district appropriately, we could get off minimum receivership. It's like it, it, yep. it, it, it's like the town's only shot at getting off minimum receivership. And so I really think us having that complete picture and the nuance picture, I think makes to the other side of it, it might make these things seem way more attractive than we even think they are. But yep. we just yeah. But but Paul, the problem is that's all knowable information. It all can be modeled. Us giving lip service to say, well, gee, it makes sense to do that. It, it, these are financial deals we're dealing with. They're very complex. We should be able to model that out. We should be able to answer what does that get for us? What is the trade-offs? Right now, we're sitting here giving lip service to, well, it's just a great deal. We should do this. It's like, we can quantify this. We don't have that information in front of us. It should be a minimum of information we have as we process these complex deals. No, I agree. I, 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 I didn't hear any counselor say this was a great deal and we should do it. I mean, I guess that's my, I guess I would take issue with that. I don't think any of us has said that. Well, Paul, you just, you just implied that, you know, because it may get us off, you know, minimum receivership, that should be something that we should have. Right. I agree with you. Let's put it on paper and look at it, but we don't have that in front of us right now. Well, that, and, that's my, and quite frankly, you know, um, quite, quite frankly, I, I pulled that point information myself. Um, you know, I went online, I pulled that document before anything came out. Um, that's how I got those questions that I was asking. Um, and, you know, it was asked in the last workshop and it was said, you know, we need the 75% for the three points, but um, it's, it's more nuanced than that. That is accurate, but it's not, not the big picture. And, you know, um, you know, to our credit, we put together a lot of questions. Uh, we had a lot of questions. We put together a lot of questions um, that I feel we owe, and I'm sure we all do feel we owe the residents of Scarborough. And um, I think it sounds like there's some more, some more work to take a look at, um, you know, from an analysis point of minimum receivership and tax shifting and 25% versus 50% versus 75%. And um, it's the, the point system document um, that the housing authority provided um, to anybody online that wants to click it is really very easy to read and very clear. And when I got down to the tax rebate section, um, it's not what they call it, but I can't remember what they call it. It was like, well, it's a very straightforward, you know, if you get this, then we'll give you this many points. If you get this, then we'll give you this many points. And I thought, well, wow, that kind of says, why didn't we quite, you know, why didn't we do this? Um, so I, you know, I guess, uh, I, I think we started out in a point where, um, you know, there was seemingly some criticism for asking questions and trying to understand this, um, or the kind of the nuances, especially coming through the economic development tip versus the affordable housing tip um, that it would normally come through. So, you know, hopefully we're past that, and uh, you know we can we can look at this with cool heads. Jim, yeah. did you have your uh, John and then Jim? So, if I can just add that I I have done a lot of that analysis, Peter. I, I know I shared it a while back with the the council. It's not it's not an easy analysis because you need to project what's going to happen to the student population in the state, right? And where are they going to be? Are they going to be in Scarborough or other cities? And how are other cities going to grow relative to Scarborough? And then look at that in the context of the, the funding formula for schools. 
Um, so there's a lot of what ifs, you know, what if this happens and whatnot. And uh, the bottom line, I think uh, the way to keep it simple is that the more value within this TIF district that we're able to capture, uh, the better our chances are of, of either moving out of re minimum receivership, or even if we don't move out of minimum receivership, to maximize the, the reimbursement from the state. I think right now we'll probably get 5% back anyways, uh, even as a minimum receiver. Jim, did you, you had your hand up a while ago. Yeah. Oh yeah, no problem. And I just wanted to make a quick comment. And again, this isn't in um, response to against anything that was said already, because these are good questions. I just want to point out too that there was, um, so just from our end, it was a, an existing TIF that's in a downtown TIF, um, which already existed. So the vehicle was there to pursue this. So the end result was um, the, the, the request would have been very similar under both. In other words, get the maximum points and time mattered. In other words, time did matter even when we were first discussing this with the town and the CEA within the existing downtown and the fact that it fit with the downtown vision for mixed use development and there's some advantages to having a downtown TIF also came into play. That's not against anything that was said. I just wanted to provide some context. But I think, you know, that's, that's a great, great point. You know, for me personally, you know, as, as late as a week after the workshop, there were additional documents given to counselors dated May 21st, you know, and, and maybe that's an internal communication thing. I'm not, not quite sure how we, you know, we worked that out ourselves, but, you know, I think that would have given opportunity, um, you know, to understand, you know, exactly what you're saying, Jim, either way, time was a factor and points were a factor. So, um, you know, the sooner we had understood that, I think the better it would have been. And obviously it was a crazy year. It was COVID, but I'm not quite sure why the documents, um, weren't shared, uh, you know, when they were received by the town and maybe that's something that can be answered at some point. Well, I, I feel like I'm being accused of uh, withholding information. So I, I feel as though I should respond. Um, if you're referring to the application for the affordable housing initiative program, Councilor Gleistein, you, you referenced a document dated May 21st? Yeah, the documents that came out, the the town, the night of the workshop and the affordable housing Alliance committee, they were all dated May 21st. So, I mean, I, I, I certainly could have missed it, but I didn't even know they were asking for 75%. I, you know, I didn't know they were coming through the downtown tip until the, the, the packet came out three days before the workshop. And I just want to be clear, I'm not accusing anybody of anything. Well, I'm just saying, I wonder how we can, how we can improve the, how we can improve the process, you know, I'm and sorry, how that, that's the way I'm taking it. That's that's why we workshop these items to make not, sure you get the information. Not intended at all. Uh, just with respect to the uh, application, the alliance is your designated uh, advisory body to be running this program, and so the documents went to them. Could they have been copied to you at the time they received? Of course, but they went to the the party that was intended to conduct the thorough review and make recommendations to you. So I think we followed process. I guess the other point I just want to make. Uh, in response to some of Councilor Hayes' questions, I don't remember the exact date, but it's been a couple of weeks. It was around the last workshop date. I provided uh, direct links to the QAP with specific reference to the point system. So uh, I was trying to make you uh, abundantly aware of, of how that system worked. So, uh, Tom, just to clear, just for my own understanding there. So when you said there, so if I just heard you right, essentially, the document dating in May goes to the, the Housing Alliance first and foremost. So the, the workflow would be Housing Alliance yeah. looks at this. Right. Housing Alliance determines if this is even worth us pursuing it, so to speak. They're the body that receives the application, conducts the review, and makes recommendation. Yes. Yeah, that makes sense. But we had a workshop before they met. We met the week before they met. So, uh, Councillor Hamill. I just uh, just a question. If if we had, I you know this does touch on a, it's a process question I have more than anything is, you know I think part of the challenge we're having here is when <clears throat> this gets on the radar screen of the council, 
you know, and I think that is part of the, the root cause for why we're struggling with getting our arms around it now. And why I've had some controversy around that. But is it is it true that if we if there had been a zoning change required, we would have, as a council, uh, seen this sooner than than when we did or not? Is that because it would have required council action at that point to change the TIF, the downtown TIF? Well, about well, it. In fact, we began discussions early in the in the year. February is my recollection. I can look back. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, things went dark for four months, frankly. And so as soon as we possibly could, Brooks was emailing me, you know, when we're, we're moving through planning board, we're preparing for fall application to main housing, we'd like to get in front of council. So uh, we ultimately right. were able to do that in July. And that's unfortunate for the lag. But Again, I'm not, I'm not pointing fingers. I'm just trying to get a handle on, you know, what our, you know, what our levers are as a council. And I, I forgot all about the fact that uh, COVID broke in the middle of March, you know, so I, but I, I think this has been on the radar screen and sort of in the back of people's minds. And we said affordability and senior income, you know, sort of senior housing. And we're thinking, well, how could we possibly have an issue with that? Because it lines up with so many things. Uh, but then, you know, we get down to re reviewing the details and here we are. So anyway, it's just a, uh, something to keep in mind, I think, as we as we go forward. Yeah, I guess the other thing I would say is this, the expectations of this council are different than past. And, and uh, you know, shame on me for not uh, appreciating that point. Uh, we've not done that level of financial analysis on the other two affordable housing, uh, the three affordable housing uh, uh, projects in place. And so that I'll, I'll accept that responsibility. Fair, fair point, Tom. Thanks. Yeah, and I, I mean, just uh, just to add to that real quick, I mean, we met in late July about this as a council, and we're going to wrap this up if, if it proceeds in mid-September. So I guess if we stripped this all away, I would say that that is plenty of process to take on one issue. And as a council, if we need more time than that on every issue, we're in trouble, you know? So I I, I, I can understand. I mean, I, th I feel like at this point, honestly, we're all going to feel like everything snuck up on us because we have this backlog of stuff. But if you look at the timeline that was laid out, I don't think our timeline is unreasonable by any stretch. I mean, we're doing what we should be doing right now. Peter and then Betsy. Peter, mute. Peter, mute. Peter. What is different about this is this level of detail that we're getting in the time frame that is a little bit different. But I, I, the question I have you know, just doing simple math, the difference between the 75 CEA um, versus a 50% is a million plus to taxpayers over a lifetime of this. And the question becomes, if, if it gets to the same points and if we go to a 50% affordable housing TIF and we don't make this year's cycle, but it makes next year's cycle, what does that do? Does it, does it impact the chances of the project going forward? Does it it just delay it a year, and if that's the case, um, but we don't know what those numbers are. We should know what those numbers are. Um, that's the work I don't think we've done. Um, when you say the financial analysis, we should have known the choices were a 75% or a 50%, and what does that mean? And so my question to those that are proposing this would be, you know, what happens if, if the 50% C, you know, is a better place for us to be a better value for the, for the taxpayers. It doesn't impact the success of the project. It just moves it out a year. Is that a reasonable assumption? What are the consequences? Uh, the, the certainly consequences of moving out a year. We certainly want to move forward this as soon as we can. Uh, you know, t as you know, time goes on, construction costs go up. Um, you know, we're ready to do this project now. Uh, it's a great project. Um, if, you know, if we did look to create an affordable housing TIF, you know, 75% would give us four points and that would be even better for the deal. I, I understand what you're saying, but, um, you know, certainly I think um, it's important to try to get this thing funded this year. It's a great project for, for your town. I mean, I don't mean to put you on this spot, Mike, but the, I guess the, the way around this is uh, potentially moving forward on the path we're on, but to move it from 75% to 50%. And I, I'm not asking you to respond to that, but that's a, a way to stay on track and yep. put you in position. 
Yeah, I that's, don't know what that that's does. one less point, and that one less point can make a difference. Fair enough. I understand. Absolutely can make a difference. And there have been a lot of projects who have missed it by one point. I, I fully understand that. I, I also do appreciate that this site is, uh, uh, is likely to score very, very well for any number of reasons. And so, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's, again, I'm not looking for a decision from you, but that's a way around this issue for sure. It is. And I guess I'd like to add on, I mean, for me, I'm a little confused too, because I thought, you know, by our, you know, our growth plan, comprehensive plan, yes, we had a 10% goal for affordable housing. I think we had targeted that as developments were made that they would, the developer would be required to put in a 10% um, in each one of the developments and it would be paid for, they'd either put those in or they'd give us impact fees in lieu of fees that we've been collecting. What we're talking about in this scenario now, we have changed this to become 75% of, you know, it being on the back of taxpayers. That to me is a significantly different sort of shift in where I thought we were moving as a, when you, when the chair said this is policy and where we are, I thought the policy was we were putting on the backs of developers to help us fund the affordable housing with the 10% requirement. This is dramatically shifting it so that it's 75% of it is on, on, is on taxpayers. That's a really Peter, short. Are you referencing me when I said it was policy? Cause I don't think I ever said it was policy today. So I, well, you I said, the did it. excuse me. I don't think I referenced any policy today. So I, are you, you referenced what I had said. I just don't, Recall, it was, I, I thought it was you. I apologize. So it wasn't you. It was said. It was either by Tom or you. I'll say it. I'll say it. I'm reading from the 2006 comprehensive plan, which is the one still in effect. And this is in the uh, actions under the objectives for affordable housing. Quote, the town should use affordable housing tax increment financing to facilitate the construction of infrastructure needed to support new affordable housing where feasible. Uh, and it goes on to talk about uh, mixed income projects. So I think this request is actually entirely in keeping with the policy objectives. Is that is that the old comprehensive plan or the new language? That's the one that exists. It's the 2006 vintage, uh, and that that approach was very very specific in their action plans. And, and uh, what's the language of the new comprehensive plan that we haven't seen yet? Uh, I'm pleased to share it with you. Um, it's, it's available online. Uh, it, it takes a different approach. It doesn't have the same specific uh, action plans associated with different objectives, um, but it certainly still favors uh, and makes a policy priority increasing uh, diversity of housing choices and increasing housing affordability. And actually, uh, Peter, just to your point, I think there's approximately $920,000 in that account you're referencing, and they are accessing $200,000 in that account that you referenced. So. So in, in, in addition to the taxpayer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just saying that, 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 that I'm just letting you know that they, that is being used in this case. In addition. But, but I do want to duly note by the public that the language in the comprehensive plan that was due out in January is not quite as specific as what's being cited here. And that to me makes a difference. It may be that some of the, the guys who do this every day can correct me if I'm explaining this wrong, but it, I don't think it was ever envisioned that it would pure, purely fall on the backs of the developers to uh, supply affordable housing. I think they would contribute, as would the town, as does the state and federal government. This is one of those things where everybody kind of pitches in a little to be able to create a quality project that is you know, incentivizes uh, a well-built facility that's well-maintained that has residual value at the end of 15, 30, 45 years so that that's how somebody's going to make money on it at the end of the day, aside from the banks uh, or, you know, the investors. So um, am I, am I understanding this correctly? I, I never thought that we were trying to pin it all on the backs of a sim single developer. These, these projects simply won't happen at this scale without heavy subsidy. It's that simple. Um, the 10% requirement, the only zone in town that has the so-called inclusionary requirement, which says essentially 10% of all residential development must be affordable, is the Crossroads District. Uh, there is aspirational language in the comprehensive plan, the 2006 and 2020 draft, that, that talk about uh, broadening that um, townwide or, or beyond. Uh, but at this point, the only requirement is within the Crossroads District.
John, uh, I'm sorry, Jim or Mike, did you want to, did John, was John's statement accurate enough? I mean, he, I think he was looking towards you guys just to see if that was. Uh, just repeat that question. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair enough. <laughs> John. <laughs> I, I was just responding. Uh, it, it, it may be difficult for you to respond to, but the way these typically work is everybody's giving a little bit of something. So we That's have right. our housing alliances collecting money from developers with their in lieu fees. Um, and that's one source of funding. There's also the tax credits that are, I think, federally subsidized and sponsored or scored by the Maine Housing Authority. Correct. Um, it, so I'm just trying to understand the dynamic. It's not one source of funding. You're going through a lot of sources of funding to make this a viable project. That's right? correct. It really is a team effort, you know, and, you know, we look at the town of Scarborough as part of our team and, and you know, hopefully we, you know, hopefully we all can work together and uh, there's a lot of, a lot of factors involved, a lot of funding mechanisms. Absolutely. Betsy? Yeah. Yeah. I just want to make clear that, you know, everything that has come forward about this project, um, you know, from the developers, you know, is, is, looks great. I don't think anybody is um, questioning the, the, you know, what you guys have done or what you do or how you do it. Um, you know, it was, it was, uh, I think, John, you described it well. It's very complex in terms of how you get these things done. And then some money gets set aside. And if you don't need it all, then it goes into the next project. Um, whether or not that actually, you know, if there's one coming into this one that's kind of helping this one get off the ground, there's engineering, there's all these kind of things that have to happen to make quality projects happen. So I, I think, um, you know, uh, the, the questions I had, you know, were really more around um, the vehicles that we used to move this forward. And um, I agree that now, I think we do have a good process in place. As I said, I, I appreciate that we have um, done this Q&A um, and we still have a little more to learn. Um, I was you know, responding to uh, what happened in the last meeting was there was pushback on um, folks expressing opinions and asking questions when that was just a very starting point. Um, so I think we're on the right, the right path now. And I do think that we have a good process in place um, to take a look at this. We, the only thing we don't have is we don't have enough time to do a TIF for 30 years. So that's the big piece of analysis that we really will have to do. Good, okay. Um, I think I'll continue with some of the FAQs. Oh. Sorry, bear with me, I, I've lost them in our discussion. I'm going to, I think the next one is essentially asking about what level of, uh, where are we Tom in relation to our aspirational goals of affordable housing versus um, what the actual affordable housing stock is. Um, so it says, what level of need for, of, for senior and affordable housing units in Scarborough and how is it determined and by whom, if we haven't set targets, how will we know when we've had enough? And I would personally like to expand on that because I think it's important to talk about this in the context of the state of Maine. I think we have a housing crisis for, um, for the older folks in the entire state. So I don't know if, I feel like Mike or Jim, you might be able to speak specifically to the need and then maybe Tom, you can just speak to how we've fulfill the need as a town and then we'll take it from there. Yeah, you know, certainly there's, there's, there's a great need. I think that's been well documented. Um, you know, uh, uh, you know, the, the need for affordable housing for seniors and families, both is, is very high. The, the cost to get an apartment, if you can find one is, is significant. Um, it's, we can back it up by a waiting list. You know, all of our, all of our properties have significant waiting lists. Um, you know, and we just see it it's it's there it's evident um uh you know it's our it's been our goal and our strategic plan to you know create 200 units of housing in, in, in south fulton area um and also to look to communities like scarborough to to create this type of housing um uh i, I just think it's well documented i, I it's it's it, you know it's out there it's uh the wait lists are, are large i think we have our wait list numbers in here um Hope that answers your question. I don't have any specific numbers in front of me, but uh, it's, it's it's a dire need. 
Where'd Tom go? Sorry, my screen shifted. Tom, is there um, well, the, our, where we are in a town as our target of 10%? Yeah, the, the performance standard in the 2006 comp plan says, as it relates to affordable housing, at least 10% of the new housing units built in Scarborough when averaged over a five-year period are affordable to low or moderate income households as identified by the town. I, I don't have that calculation in front of you. I can tell you that uh, we have a total of 315 units that are built and occupied right now. Uh, there's another 138, including this project, since it's approved already. Uh, so that totals is uh, 453 total units. And so uh, that suggests to me that we're, we're still very, very, very much below the 10%. I think we have made some progress in the last, uh, you know, during the period of this current comp plan, uh, but there's still a lot of work to do. And I, I just don't have the exact numbers in, in front of me uh, to share with you. Um, Don and then Peter. Yeah, I was just, uh, I don't have the numbers either, but uh, some, I, had, I think Ken had shared a number of 8,500 units in town that we exist now, if you count homes. I, I don't know what the, the number is off the top of my head, but that would suggest around 5%, right? 453 over 8,500, something like that. 8,500 is the number of residential tax bills. So um, I don't think, I. you're right, your math, uh, that makes sense, uh, but units would, you'd be comparing an apartment unit to a single family home unit. So I suspect that percentage is actually lower when you okay. consider all those those factors. But thanks. Peter? Yeah, I guess my question would be, I mean, it's great to have goals, but do we actually, just as you know, Mike has suggested, there's waiting lists. Do we know what the specific need is in Scarborough? Is there a waiting list for these particular types of units? I mean, do we, you know, it's great that we have a 10% goal, but do we, do we actually know what the need is in Scarborough right now? I think we, Tom, could we reach out to Cindy Taylor and ask yeah. her? Is it Cindy Taylor, I'm sorry, is that her last name? We, we do not maintain a list, so we don't have that. But I, I think a good barometer would be talking to Cindy Taylor, who um, owns and operates Bessie Commons here. Uh, also, um, uh, Griffin Road is another senior project, and, and we could reach out to them and find out what their wait list is. I'm pleased to do that. I mean, I think that'd be helpful. And then too, I think it's later on, but you know, if, if, you know, will there be preference given to Scarborough residents? And I think you've answered that affirmatively. So I think if there is a great need, then I would like to see built into this that Scarborough residents get, you know, priority to get the units that are available. That's certainly something that we, uh, we wanted to do even coming into this project. That's very important. We help. We'll have a preference um, system. It's a point system, and we'll give Scarborough residents, um, you know, the most amount of points. So that if there's any Scarborough residents, they will certainly be housed before anybody else. And my my feeling that would be that the wait list there'd always be enough people on the wait list from Scarborough that would always be housing residents from Scarborough. Uh, and the other points that we give out are to veterans. Betsy. Uh, yeah, I just, I think, Don, the, the 10%, I think Tom said it's 10% of um, what's built over the last average of the last five years is not 10% of all housing stock was my understanding of it. And then the other 10% requirement is the downs. That's the one that's required to do 10%. Thanks. Um, Mike, have you ever held housing for... So, I mean, I, I could imagine once it's full, you know, that you might not have open slots for quite some time. Um, have you ever done a project where, so you did it in Standish and you hold, held a couple of units um, open for Standish residents? Um, or is that just not feasible? You have to keep them rented. And then if an opening comes up, you do the point system. Uh, you know, in South Portland, um, you know, we, we, have, we, we have a South Portland preps. Pre, uh, um, residency preference for our units there. And um, we never hold a unit. We never keep a unit vacant, but because uh, people need housing, we, we want to house them as quick as we can. We want to turn the units over as quick as we can when someone moves out and get someone in as quick as we can. Uh, most of the times though, it's it's a cell pool and resident on the list because our lists are so long and, and you know, um, we don't usually have that issue. 
Okay. Yeah, great. Thank you. I don't think you would in Scarborough either. Obviously, I don't have a crystal ball, but I really don't think you would. I think you'd find that this project would be serving Scarborough residents 100%. Yeah. Okay, any more? So I, I was glancing up through the FAQs. I think we've covered most of them, so I'm going to skip. Um, if somebody else in the background wants to skim them on their own computer, please do. So I, I feel like we probably want to get to the language of the CEA and the financial analysis. So I just for the sake of, I feel like in our discussion, we've hit a lot of those FAQs. Feel free to, uh, Peter. Yeah, just, just one question on the FAQs. And I, I didn't understand the explanation, but I, I think Mike, I think on your project report, the cost of the land of this project's north of $12 million, I think is the total project cost. Yet what we're using to model the impact of the town is only an assessed value of about 6.7 million. I'm just trying to figure out, and I couldn't understand from the explanation, how can we have a project cost of 12, almost 13 million and only an assessed value of, of 6.7 million that we're using to run the tax calculations on? And I, I know that's what got spit out by the machine, but I had thought with the reval that just occurred, we were pretty close to market value in our evaluations, our assessments. So I'm just trying to understand why there's such a, a gap between project costs and assessed value. Yeah, it, what question number was that? Just so I can turn to it, just to. I think it's just the, I, uh, Mike, there, there's a current news article that has it at 14 million as well. So I think what, P, the town assessor, I, I'll let Tom speak this yeah. more specifically, but I believe the town assessor is projecting it will be worth approximately $7 million. But even the media right now, the, the press releases, there's one right now, I believe, in the forecast that ha, has this reference as $14 million. So I think- yeah. Well, it, it's, it, it's right in the cost report that they submitted. Their performa has the total project cost. Yeah, I, I think the, the difference is between the assessed value, which is the fair market value, which is what somebody would pay for a 60-unit building with sub, with- uh, rent controlled housing. That's what the assessor is getting at. And the other is how much it would cost to build that. And that's really the whole dynamic that why we need all these funding mechanisms to bridge that gap. So somebody, according to the assessor, would pay 6.8 million to purchase this facility after it's built. Whereas I think what you're saying is it's going to cost about 14 to build it. Yeah, I think 14, I, I, I I'm, I'm seeing 12.4 in here. Uh, you know, there's a lot of soft costs in there, a lot of costs to get to this point uh, that aren't actual construction costs to go through the main housing process. Um, th those costs are significant. And not to mention where you have affordability restrictions on these projects, it might bring down the value of this building. Um, you know, like you just said, for the, as a market value approach, because, you know, the rents are, are lower. The rents by themselves will not support the construction of this project. That's typical, just to add to that, Mike, um, uh, what that kind of situation is typical because they're, they're using both an income approach where they're looking at the income stream, in this case, which is affordable, and they're looking at the construction cost. But even communities that are at near 100% that did revals, the construction costs most always come in higher than the actual assessed value. And that's not just Scarborough, that's true everywhere. That's a typical situation, the way assessments are done. But is it usually about 50% difference? Between I can't comment on that. It could be, it could be 50%. I've seen it that different, but, um, but it, when you add in that it's typically done, even for market rate development, if this was not even affordable, that's common that that happens. Then you add in the affordability and the restriction on the income factor, therefore that makes it lower. I can't tell you whether 50% is, I'm not an assessor. I just know a lot about assessing. If I could, the assessor used the existing cost schedules in the vision appraisal system as he would um, you know, deriving any value for a commercial property, uh, considering the construction type and, and um, quality. And, and then of course, also considering uh, the, the affordable housing component and the restrictions on the income, I believe in the cost schedule, there's actually a category of affordable housing, which considers those unique factors. So, you know, this is done, um, you know, by him building it from the ground up based on his review of the plans. I think he talked to the developer to better understand the project. Um, at the end of the day, it, it, 
it will likely be even a different number than this. So we're deriving a number for purposes of calculating, um, you know, uh, these tip, uh, revenue projections. And that's an important part of that. But at the end of the day, it will be what the assessor makes it um, each and every year. Um, I tend to expect that uh, the assessor is much closer to the final value than is uh, the developer's project cost. Don, did you have a question? And then Betsy, I think. Uh, no, I'm, I'm fine okay. for now. All right. Betsy? Uh, just as a point of comparison, and, and maybe this makes no sense, so I'm kind of speaking without looking at research, but um, would we have those numbers, anything comparable to look at, Tom, for um, the, say, Avesta or one of the other projects? This is what the they brought forward in the performa as the construction cost, and this is what it was valued at when it was all finished. Is that is that something? It wouldn't be apples to apples because this is its own project and its own timing and all that. But just to Peter's point of kind of what that looks like a lot of times. I, I suppose I could probably source that information uh, in terms of what their project costs were. Uh, it's we have it somewhere in our files. I I can try to. I, again. I, what it's worth, I have confidence in the assessor's process that he's undertaken for the purpose of, of, of this exercise. Gotcha. Um, I, I could just add, I, I, I was in touch with the assessor a fair bit um, and, and he had earlier actually had a lower assessed value estimate um, and, and had revisited it because he had learned of additional components of the project that added value to bring it up to the 6.875, including the elevator paving and some of the other construction details. So he's def he definitely was paying attention to the details and coming up with that 6,875,800 number for whatever that's worth for folks. Okay, I think at this point, let's move on to, um, we will do the CEA, the draft CEA itself. Um, I'm not going to read the draft CEA. I guess I'm just opening it up for questions if any councilors have read it and have questions for Shauna since she's here. I'll start with Don. Yeah, I had a question, Shauna, on, thanks for coming, by the way, I want to work on this. Uh, uh, about the transferability, I know we had, a, uh, we had a, an answer that it, uh, it's not transferable except for uh, pledge and assignment of right title and interest for purpose of securing financing. But as I'm reading section 7.2, it says, but that's on behalf of the developer uh, within the district or for an assignment to a successor entity or affiliate entity or any other entity controlled by the developer. So can you, is that, is that still, you know, the longer answer here jibe with the 10A in our Q&A answer? So I don't have the Q&A up in front of me at this moment, but I can tell you what the what the draft says, and, and this is a draft at this point in time, um, but the 7.1 language speaks to already consenting, the town already consenting to the pledge and assignment of this credit enhancement agreement for purposes of financing the project. 7.2 is what you're focused on, which is essentially any transfers uh, or assignments otherwise. And the language here is that the developer is not permitted to transfer or sign the document, the agreement, without consent of the legislative body of the town, which is in this case the council, which consent shall not be unreasonably withheld or delayed. That is fairly standard language for a credit enhancement agreement, but it is by no means, you know, required that this town use that language. Um, so if, if you have specific questions about that, please let me know, but that's, that's the language that's in there at this moment. So the developer is uh, South Portland uh, Housing Authority. So what would be, what would be a fill an affiliated entity? Or, you know, what do we know? Or, I mean, it, could it, it, it would, have to be an affiliate entity of South Portland Housing, right? Yes. Okay. I'm sorry. I, I see now where you're focusing on the language, which is um, other than for the purpose of securing financing or for an assignment to some closely related entity, at which, which those are permissible. Um, I cannot actually think of a, a, an example where that has occurred. Um, I think the example that's intended there is 
so long as the developer and, and actually the developer is a defined term in this in this document so um i believe it's actually the contracting entity to the cea um which is oak hill um, senior housing limited partnership um, so it would have to be an entity controlled by that limited partnership okay yeah, I would tell you, I don't like the unreasonably withheld or delayed uh, language mm -hmm. that kind of strikes the value of the whole thing, the whole prohibition, doesn't it? Uh, I have had that criticism. Um, I've heard that criticism in other places, and, and there have been clients of mine who have said, no, let's let's change that. We, we are not comfortable with it. We need complete freedom, um, and we can certainly consider that. I think... Um, it does leave a little bit of um, uncertainty in terms of what that means. Um, and I think the concept here is that in a lot of these circumstances um, that where I have seen credit enhancement agreement transfers occur, it's trying to facilitate some sale of a property and um, be, you know, wanting to be able to process that relatively quickly is important, so long as there isn't any, you know, major changes in the way that project, as originally envisioned by the town and the community, um, it, you know, viewed it and, and is actually functioning, it should be, um, you know, generally okay. But, um, but that's, you know, that's certainly subject to change um, at the direction of this body. I have, a, I have to confess, so I have a bias that I think we're generally reasonable as a body. So hopefully, you know, <laughs> don't need the unreasonable withholding of the request language. But anyway, you get the point. Thank you. Betsy? Yeah, I think I think Don's point would get to my question, but I, I don't pretend to, you know, completely understand all the language here. I've read it a few times, but um, I, I uh, was looking at a similar one, you know, for South Portland and, in this part, you know, they said they would do it, but it had to remain affordable housing. And, and I know we've heard based on main tax credits, it has to stay affordable for 45 years. Um, but, you know, these, these deals, um, you know, I, it's unfortunate, I think, that towns have to get into these highly complex legal deals that wrap, that are, you know, tying up future taxpayers for and residents, you know, who aren't even alive yet in these really complex legal deals. It is where we are today and how it works, but um, we don't have anything that says in our own legal agreement um, that I can tell two things, which is one that um, we put some kind of term on it that, it that from a town standpoint, regardless of what Maine State Housing does or does not do with tax credits and the IRS does or does not do, that this will stay affordable and, um, you know, maybe it says if you're going to go to sell it, uh, then it has to go back to the town council. But it seems like we would want something in there just from our for ourselves. And then the other one is language about the point system or some system that we allude to of how uh, Scarborough residents would get highest priority. That seems like that should also be in this and transferable. Um, so. Again, I, I don't even pretend to understand all the all the legal ins and outs of it, but um, just based on what I understood, I felt like those two things, you know, were kind of missing from my standpoint. Wait. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, you go ahead. I, I was just going to say, uh, you know, I, I do think um, you're right in many of these affordable housing um, credit enhancement agreements, we rely on the fact that they will be obligated to maintain affordability standards through the federal program, but we can certainly add that language to make it clear and specific um, and to mirror what those requirements will be. Um, so I, I will take that um, back with me. Um, and then with regard to the, the Scarborough um, residence pr priority, um, I mean, it does inject a different dynamic into the credit enhancement agreement to create sort of performance standard. Um, and I want to understand, I mean, I, I think, you know, I'll, I would like the, you know, the developer certainly can have an opportunity to respond to that, I think, and, and how it might impact, um, you know, what Maine State Housing Authority and others um, 
you know, if they would say anything or have any issue with that. Um, and I, and then I think the question I would just have is if we were to put that into the agreement, um, would it be, how would we enforce it? You know, what specifically are, would the town be requiring the developer to do with regard to Scarborough residents? Um, it's always tricky to, to put these things onto the paper. And so, um, but I can certainly give it some thought. I'd love if you have more thoughts about the detail of how that would play out, that would be helpful. And, you know, it, it could certainly be includable in the credit enhancement agreement. It also we would be more than willing to enter, enter into a memorandum of agreement with this, with the town for that same thing, which could be referred to in the, in the agreement also. It's possible that you could condition the award of the grant, which is kind of a, a separate, but certainly related matter. Um, you could somehow make that a condition of that. I think you, it presents some enforceability challenges uh, in and of itself, but there's another council action that you could attach that expectation to. That's a good idea too, Tom. All right, yeah, it's a good idea. Well, well like once the grant is granted, then yeah, I guess you would be obligated through, because you took the grant money to maintain a Scarborough uh, point system or however you would determine that it would make sense to do it. Any others for Shauna about the actual draft CEA? No? Okay, Tom, I'll let you tee up the, um, the I guess the revenue side of the financial analysis and address the cost sure. side. Certainly. Um, could you pull that um, spreadsheet up? I will, yep. Give me one okay. second here. I have to rotate it and got a little confused mm -hmm. here. This one? Yes, thank you. So this is a very typical uh, TIF revenue projection table that is produced um, uh, for these projects. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, Sean has been working closely with the town assessor. So you'll see here, uh, this models out over the 27 year term. Uh, you know, it, it does take into consideration uh, when the full value will be brought online. That's essentially in the project year three, but year five of the TIF. Uh, and then we'll show you the breakdown out over time and, and distribution of, of the TIF revenue. Um, I will note we have made some assumptions uh, in this model and uh, these assumptions are open for debate and discussion. Uh, I don't think there's any magic answer. Uh, we have assumed a 3% mill rate increase uh, consistently. Uh, we're also assuming a reval uh, every seven years and the effect of that um, on this model would be property value is increasing by 9% um, at the reval year, and then a mill rate decrease of 9%. And I think that's reflective of uh, some of our past experience. Um, again, we've, um, we've, we've, we did this fairly simple, kind of flatlined it, um, but we appreciate that uh, we know mill rates will increase, we know we'll do revals, and so we've made some assumptions around both of those factors. Uh, I guess the, the, the other piece just to mention, because this currently is proposed to be within an existing uh, downtown TIF that has 3% of um, TIF revenue going to the towns um, for, for the town's purposes other than general fund. So that 3% is calculated and reported separately. So that's the, uh, the ex um, revenue side of the equation, so to speak. Maybe I'll stop there and certainly we could have a conversation around the assumptions we, we've made. Uh, again, at, at the end of the day, time and experience will dictate what happens in terms of value, in terms of mill rates, in terms of revals. Um, so I'm not saying it doesn't necessarily matter. It, I want to make sure we're all comfortable with the assumptions that have been made for purposes of modeling this right now. Tom, do you just because I think it might be easier for us? Do, can you just because you and I have gone back and forth about just the cost side? I, I have I think pushed on you a few times just to say, hey, we know the cost of a typical one bed uh, one bedroom apartment, right? So, but there are challenges with the cost side of the equation. And um, can I pull that up and you can just speak to that, and then we can talk oh, about sure. it. Okay. Entirety. So. Yeah, and and 
Forgive me, uh, this is not my forte and, uh, and I'm at a loss with some key staff being on vacation. So what I've done in the, in, in the meantime is try to lay out for my own thinking and I'm interested to get some input from the council tonight, uh, just laying out what the potential costs of municipal services are for a project. And then specifically try to provide some context for this project. Um, you know, perhaps what I've listed here, these six items are not all conclusive and that's the sort of input I want. But for this project, since it's senior affordable, uh, it's, we, we can safely assume there's no education expense. Um, in most cases, these sorts of impact analyses, uh, that will be the single biggest cost driver. For public safety, I think we can look to two existing very similar projects uh, in town, Bessie One and Griffin. Uh, we can, we can, um, modify uh, for the different units um, and, and extrapolate um, there as well. Um, I would just note that the largest demand on public safety is for EMS and medical assistance. And depending on the nature of that call, uh, any transport is covered uh, typically through third party reimbursement or, or Medicare. So there is some revenue stream that offsets that expense. But Tom, it's not all upset, right? I mean, isn't that been the issue that Medicare only pays about 80% of costs. So we don't get, it's not totally offsetting. There's still a net cost to us. Yeah, to yeah. yeah I was just, I was just so. observing that other than tax revenue, there is a revenue stream associated with that service that will offset some of the cost. Correct. Uh, public works, uh, Mike, may, maybe you can be helpful here. Uh, the two things there, you know, are really for uh, maintenance of roads and solid waste from you know, our perspective in terms of the current services we offer our residents. Uh, can I presume that you, your project will be taking care of obviously plowing on this private lot and, and trash? What was the other thing? I'm sorry. Solid waste, trash removal. Yes. Yes. We'll be taking care of that. Absolutely. So we're not picking up your trash, Mike? No. So Tom, I had a question on that and this is from a resident. So, um, and it's, you know, belies my ignorance, so I might as well put it out there. Um, so, you know, we are building more multi-unit housing. This is one example. Um, and it, um, I know that we did quite a few sewer upgrades um, across town. Is, are we well situated in terms of the sewer system that we have to support um, the growth and especially the multi-use housing? Um, this is my understanding um, you know, that sometimes it takes more, um, more sewer capacity well, along well, the line. Scarborough Sanitary Sewer District is an independent authority, so I don't have direct involvement in or knowledge of, uh, although I'm quite confident in saying that there is excess treatment conveyance and treatment capacity that exists in the system. Uh, and they, if you talk to anyone in the development community, they do a very good job of making sure they collect uh, fees and they've got uh, very healthy reserves to expand uh, and enhance when, yeah. the, when necessary. Um, I guess the other thing I'd say is that with, with, this, with development happening within our growth areas, I'm even more confident of our capacity to, to handle from a sewer point of view. So, okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, mm -hmm. just passing on a question that I received um, a couple of days ago. Thank you. So the other services I just list for conversation purposes would be any involvement in our community services programs. In this instance, it would be probably our senior services. Um, I, you know, I'm at a bit of a loss to, to understand how many residents might partake and we can, we can do our best to attribute a cost to that. Uh, similarly with library services. And then, you know, I include traffic and we've touched on it earlier uh, but in this case, uh, you know, it's fairly modest or fairly small, I'll say, uh, trip generation as a result of the, the project, really because of the nature of the demographics of its residents. Um, and then on top of that, there are impact fees being paid. So arguably, uh, you know, that impact is being already captured or that uh, the cost of that impact is already being captured. So. I guess I'd have two questions. One, are there other services that come to any of your minds that we should be aware of? And then if there are, um, 
you know, let's talk about those. And then if we can talk about the ones I've included here, which of these do we want to spend more time to cost out? John? So, I mean, I think it's good to go through the detail, but I, I kind of think a 30,000 foot view of this one's helpful. Um, if, if you look at school costs relative to our total net budget, it's about 70%. Um, and then if you look at what this CEA will do us in terms of reducing our uh, or increasing our municipal revenue sharing and reducing our uh, state funding or increasing actually our state funding for schools, um, you get to about 75%. And that's the CEA that we're looking at. It's, it's basically, it's close to break even. Um, it's not going to be a huge draw either way. So you, when you get into the details, you might find that, okay, well, like you said, public works, you know what, they're actually going to do their own trash and they're going to, there's the streets already there. There's not going to be additional road to be plowed and, and maintained. Um, so I, I guess kind of thinking through it intuitively like that at a 75% CEA, I think this is close to break even. You can flow it out over 30 years if you want and, and work in different assumptions, but you're not going to get too far different than that. Um, that's my perspective anyways. Well, from my perspective, though, I mean, what, what we're saying is for about $22,000 a year, we think this is going to be a break even. And I, I hear you, John. What it doesn't include, though, is any infrastructure support or cost. I mean, what we're identifying are direct sort of incremental cost. But well, we got, you know, this is a, a prime commercial property. We got a $100 million, $80 million school coming down the pike and three or four years, got a $22 million public safety building. What, what's not built into these numbers is what is the opportunity cost if that had been developed as a commercial property and contributing 100% of the taxes versus, you know, 22 cents on the dollar. And what it doesn't include is debt service and all the infrastructure costs that others are going to pick up, whereas this commercial property would have carried some of that if it was developed in some other capacity. So there is there is an opportunity cost that we haven't factored into this. Can I ask though, uh, is, if you do so, and I understand why you suggest that, I've heard you make similar uh, suggestions before, but should we also try to value uh, the public purpose being served, the, the, the public policy value? If we're trying to be all inclusive? Yeah, there's that. And then there's the economic development factor where this tends to spur other development in the area, which to your point, Peter, would help to cover some of those additional costs. Um, but your point's valid. Peter. There, there's opportunity costs. This is something that it's in front of us. It's, uh, you know, it's pretty far down the pike. Um, I think it's positive. I think, I, you know, I think, I think it will spur other development down the road. And, uh, and probably the type of development that we're looking for, especially if you get an office building next door or some more retail or, or shops in that area, like kind of like what happened in the Bessie area. Yeah, and I'm not, you know, to get to Tom's point, I'm not necessarily arguing. I'm just saying, you know, part of doing analyses is then once you get to a number, you can say, is that policy opportunity cost worth it? But when we don't look at that and we don't know what it is, um, then I don't think we're making totally informed decisions about what's what's the best value of which. And we can make a policy decision, but that, but Tom was just asking, are there some costs missing? And I'd only suggest that there are some opportunity and infrastructure costs that this property as developed as proposed will not support down the pike. And I mean, I, if you just do the school calculation, when the school comes online, if it's 80 to 100 million, which are some of the numbers that have been talked about, that's going to be about a 15% hit to the property tax rate the year that comes online. I mean, it's a $10 million debt service. So that's a, that's coming down the pike. Growth helps us to be able to support that in the future. So I just think knowing what those opportunity costs are and then asking the policy question is a great way to make decisions, but without having that rubric to make the decision, you're not making and, and, and we're not providing the information to the public to be able to say, this is why we're doing what we're doing. So that's just my thought. That's I mean, the, the infrastructure cost is running, what's debt service, Tom? $8 million a year? That's right. About 10%, yep. it's about 10% of the, of the total budget. Betsy? And I would say, you know, it's, it's definitely, I think, 
a very exciting opportunity and the town is growing but you know a lot of changes coming um through the town do we have support services um that we need um for senior housing i know that we saw um you know in, in the pandemic um you know we, we had a lot of seniors in town and you know we use staff to start calling people and different departments to provide meals um and uh, I don't think we provided any transportation services um, or so when we do have our, uh, our, our sort of organization and um, uh, that helps us, it's our kind of our sister organization, um, Project Grace, that um, you know, I became familiar with some social services that they provided throughout that because they have a lot of connections. And I know South Portland, you know, is a well-formed uh, city in that right. I mean, is, is, is this an area that, you know, to support and, you know, to say that, you know, this is an area that we want to grow and participate in with the community. Um, is this an area that we're gonna need to grow as a town um, to provide more of those social services and, um, general assistance and transportation? Is this something that we're gonna to need to do? And how are we gonna determine when that happens and what that looks like um, that would make us more equivalent to a bit of bird, a South Portland, um, a Portland obviously, which on a much larger scale. I just don't think we are in that and we're filling those gaps with Project Race. We filled it uh, with employees during the pandemic um, and we've hired a, a you know, and the, the police department is filling some of those gaps in a different area. Um, but it, it just seems like there's more and more of that need. And, you know, what, what's that going to look like as we, as we grow as a town in general, not just, you know, not this particular um, sub, uh, apartment unit, because this is just 16 units, but we've got Uplands, we've got Joy Island, we've got some other ones um, coming along. What's that going to look like? Are we going to need additional support services? Good question. I don't know how to answer the question. Um, certainly not for for this project specifically. Um, I, yeah, I'd be I happy think to it's specific to this project, really. Hey, Mike, could you, do you guys do? You, so first of all, Betsy, I agree. That's an excellent question. Do you guys offer anything in house that you could? Yes, we do. Yeah, okay. we do. We, could you speak to that? Because that because yep. I think Betsy's point is incredibly valid, right? Yeah, now. I can't speak for the town. You know, the town as a whole, but. Uh, we certainly have residents. Uh, we have a li license uh, with a master's degree re res resident service coordinator. We also have an activities coordinator, uh, and uh, we also have a, a passion, a 14 passion bus that we provide transportation to take our residents on trips. You know, could be anywhere in the state. Could be the Freiburg Fair. Could be down to the botanical gardens. Um, you know, so we we are we're in our buildings uh, during the pandemic. We certainly. Uh, are still calling our residents. We have one employee that just calls our residents. Uh, you know, every uh, you know every day she's calling and make sure everybody's okay. If they need anything, um, we worked on getting them food if they needed it. Um, but a uh, really good resident service coordinator. Uh, we've also had two to three interns at a time that work with us. Uh, we take that very seriously, and this project will definitely have a, re a resident services component in in it. And um, I can assure you that we'll take care of any of that on our end. And do, do you guys do the shopping trips? Like if I, yep. like a weekly, what, you know, so if I, you make the rounds between Hanford Shaw's and Walmart and that where they can, where folks can jump on your shuttle bus and do the shopping that way if they don't drive. Yep. We sure do. We sure do. Okay. And we would That's definitely great. include this project in that too. Thank you. Any others on the? So, Tom, just to close this before we adjourn, are you going to touch base with Karen and see if we can get a little bit more detail on the cost side to the best of our ability? I know as far as um, the cost. Yes, I guess my question back, uh, do you want me to model, you know, all the services that I've listed plus uh, what I've heard tonight, the opportunity cost, infrastructure costs, and I'm going to take Mike's answer is fairly inclusive uh, on the social services, uh, sir, uh, support services. Um, I guess I'm just looking for that direction. Which elements yeah, do you I, want us to model? Yeah, and I think something in 
excuse me, because I might have this completely wrong, but like the town and country headquarters, you guys are right near that, right? We're talking, am I, do I have that correctly? Yeah. Right. So what's the value of the town and country headquarters? That's a great, to me, that's a great example of what the opportunity cost, right? So my first instinct, it's certainly not 7 million. And so is it 1.5 million? Because that would be roughly the same amount of taxable value, so to speak. So I think we have an opportunity cost building sitting right there. So I think it might be worth using that to model it. So. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure if that's the best example, but I, I, I understand what might we'll, replace we'll, in that area. It's what might replace this. It certainly isn't another residential development. It would be some sort of bank headquarters or some sort of middle office space. Sure. You know, yeah, we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll do the analysis and, and we'll define what we, what, what that is. Yep. Okay. I, without objection for everybody in the council, I'm, I'm, oh. Well, I think backing up, we were doing the 50% versus the 75 and the cost shift. Um, yeah. I didn't know, were you including that because we've talked about it previously before we got to. Yes, thank uh, you. That's a good reminder. Yeah. So just run the 50 track right next to it as well. Don? Donna and Jim, I presume we can use all the same assumptions and just change the, the calculations. Um, how about the tax yeah, shift analysis? We've not done that. Um, we can certainly run the tax shift analysis. Um, we, you know, it depends on which scenario. I, I would just like to get some clarity on which scenarios um, I should, we should run. Um, we can keep the same assumptions that we've talked about um, in terms of assessed value and mill rate and um, revaluation. Um, I'm assuming we're talking about in addition to what is currently a uh, 28 year term at 75%, we're talking about a 50% um, for 30 years. Is that the, I, I mean, would, that would have, that would have been an affordable housing TIF that we can't, we cannot do this year. I guess I would be cautious of creating too much work. Cause if we can't do it this year, let's not model it. I would do the 50 and 75% at 28 years. I mean, I, I, I guess I'm asking for consensus because at this, I, I just, I don't want to create work that's really not going to go anywhere. So. Yeah. I mean, we are where we are in this. So I think that we, you know, at some point got to start moving toward a, you know, we're going to either do it or we're going to punt and then it may never happen and who knows what, you know, would happen in the future. So, I mean, I, I support the point you make there, Paul, for heading to the barn if we can and some of the stuff. I think 50 and will be close. I mean, I mean, the 50 at 28 and the 50 at 30 is going to be close anyway. The difference for them would be the points. And that's, you know, so I think the 50 at 28 is fine. 50 at 28. Yeah. So, so whatever, whatever the term is. So now we have it at 75, it would just be at 50. Yes. Yeah, totally agree. It, people are shaking their, nodding their heads. So I'm taking that, that we're good. So, yeah. Yeah. Paul, the only thing I, Tom, the only thing I'd add, I think at one point we knew that the ambulance, the EMS, we lost about two to three hundred dollars a visit. Um, if you just do the sixty visits time, that's that alone is about eighteen thousand a year. So you may want to just check with Mike or whatever. But I, I will. I will. I think it's two or three hundred bucks a visit that we don't get reimbursed for. Shauna. <laughs> and then Jim at, the, at the risk of throwing something new um the the points if it is true that the developer's sole purpose for this credit enhancement agreement my understanding was that the the cash flow was another consideration but if that's not the case and the points are the only thing that's important here the three per points can be achieved with a 20 year 75 percent reimbursement and i'm so I just want to put that out there to the extent reaction is positive so, on all so sides. Jim, about six people's, six people's eyebrows just went up, Jim. So can you, can you address that, please? Uh, well, <laughs> so let me just, or, I'm sorry, or Mike, I'm sorry. Yeah, I don't. I'll let Mike take that. I had a different issue, but I want to stay on. Yeah. Show. Yeah. So let's stay on this one. Mike, yeah. can you respond to the, the 20 and at 75? Yeah, I, I wish I could with great detail. I don't know the QAP as well as Brooks did. And, uh, you know, I, I wish I could. I, if that's what's in the QAP uh, um, you're referring to, Shana. 
I'm, I'm looking at it right now and, yeah. and the three points is equal to or greater than 75% for at least 20 years is three points. This is the 21, 22 QAP from yeah. the Maine State Housing Mike, website. can you have, can you have Brooks just email us by like tomorrow or the next day? Just to we'll do. Okay. We'll do. I, 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 she read, read it that way and that is what it is. Okay. And we should well, know that, yeah, that so saves. I yeah. think that's a great, great point. So I would, just plug and play. I would say 20 years at 75% um, and 50% at um, the 28 years. And then we already have the 28 years at 75%. Because I, I think that's, that's a really good point. You know, I, support, I support that because those are the three realistic options we have at this point. So I think that's a fair thing to ask for. So, yeah. So you want both, both the TIF revenue projections and you want tax shift for each of those scenarios? No, that's too many. Unless it's, unless it's easy. I mean, if it's plug and play. My, that's my point on, if I may, on the tax, my question was back to the tax shift and this might be a, a Shauna question, but bear with me. Isn't the tax shift moot in the sense that it's already in a district and therefore the shift is occurring? It, it's actually not moot in this particular scenario because the capture underlying the the district area is three percent and so oh, we've okay. yep. uh, in approving the credit enhancement agreement if that's what the council does it act effectively increases the capture on this parcel i apologize that's a good that i get it now i forgot about the three it was only at three percent <clears throat> Well, if you don't want the tax shift, I think what you're asking for to do those two additional models from a TIF revenue projection point of view is you know, a fairly simple lift. And just, am I wrong in thinking top, Peter's point's probably the number one cost driver of this, the most explicit e is the ambulance service? Isn't, I mean. I would say so, yes. I mean, that's just my hunch. I'm just, I'm just thinking, I mean, to Peter's point, I mean, listing the six things that you just listed out, the, the biggest cost driver that we're looking at would be re, not being reimbursed from ambulance. I, I, yep. My gut tells me that, yes, that will be the highest driver. Yep. And then one, one final piece too, and, and Mike, I, I know you kind of stated this, but I don't want to lose the fact here. We do need to consult, like Brooks would have, Brooks had reasons why those percentages made a difference to the, to the actual project go versus no go. So Mike and I do have to reconvene with Brooks to make sure that we understand those numbers. They're, they're, it's, I don't want you to think that there's definitely no difference between those scenarios yet. We have to, we, we, need, we need to think that through on our end as well, because it's just coming at us really quick here. Yeah. yeah, and I'm gonna, uh, Jim. I'm gonna say exactly what you just said. We are not taking this as if these are all equal options to you guys. So I, I perfect. Thank you. I'm not. I'm not viewing anything. What you guys are saying is agreeing to any of this. Yep. So I'm glad and, you said that. And, and Brooks I'm, and Jim and I will will touch base tomorrow uh, tomorrow and have a You know, we'll get a response back. You guys are being incredibly non-committal as you should be. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, Paul. Paul, the only thing I'd say on the cost drivers off Tom's list. That's true. But we did talk about opportunity costs and infrastructure. So. Yep. Yeah. Those, when those are going to be much saying, bigger numbers. Yeah. When you, when you, when you're saying infrastructure, I'm thinking sewer and cars. So I, maybe there's other infrastructure I'm just not placing in my head. Well, but, it's, it's our debt service. That's part of the infrastructure. I mean, that's okay. infrastructure providing all the services in the town that exist. That's the hundred million bucks we got invested. But do you think, are you suggesting that this is going to add to our debt? I guess that's where I'm confused with debt as the driver. It's just, you know, I think it's part of what we need to model is if we had had a commercial property that was pulling up, paying 100% of the taxes, 10% of tax revenue goes to the infrastructure cost. So there's a 10% opportunity cost for infrastructure. That's just, you're, you're thinking that is that when you're, when you say infrastructure, you're talking about 10% of our budget is our Debt service. That's what that's what we're saying. That's the infrastructure cost. Yeah. yeah. All right. Okay. I'm going to um, um thank you, everybody. Oh, Don, I'm sorry. Do you, Don, you're just gonna thank it. So I wanted to just to thank Tom and um, and Brooks for doing the turn on the Q and A's. You know, these came 
at them fast and furious, you know, right in the middle of a hiatus for some, but not for you guys. So, you know, thank you for that. Uh, and also for your receptivity in terms of the other questions. What I did have one quick question. I just want to confirm that the that the two hundred dollars from that we are, have earmarked or that the Housing Alliance has recommended uh, to go to this project must go to construction costs, not to offset developers' costs. So can you confirm that for me? That that is the, the plan. I'm not aware that there was any specific guidance from the Alliance in that regard, but I think the council, you, you hold the ultimate uh, award decision. I, I don't think that would be problematic. Uh, there's certainly plenty of construction expense to defer. There was discussion on that. And I think they, I don't think that was specifically earmarked. That was just for construction costs, but I'll tell you, we have no issue with that. It being just for construction okay. costs. So you are committing to that one? No, <laughs> I, no, I, no, I, no, I, I definitely committed to that. I heard Brooks say it that night. So, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, I just think we got we got overwhelming support from the Housing Alliance, and I think that, that at the end of the day, they did not wear it that way. But that's Brooks offered that up as uh, you know, to ensure that the money be used for the project because if something happened and the project didn't go forward and we use it for pre-development costs, you know, that money would be gone. But I gotcha. Okay, we have no issues with it being for construction costs. So I just like to call that out so that as we move forward and there's two or three things that I heard that we want to kind of confirm, you know, either in the CEA or in other places as part of the steel, you know, assuming it goes forward that that would be one of the things. So Ken, I'm, Ken, I'm going to give you the last thing and then I'm going to go to public comment and then we're going to, then we're going to um, move on. So. No, actually, that's all I was going to mention the, the public comment. I thought you were going to shut it down before you took care yeah, of it. Yeah, sorry. I'm shutting us down and I'm going to go to public comment. Uh, I have one from, I believe, I have two, but one didn't request for the record. So I'm going to leave that out just because if it's not explicit, I don't know. Is there anybody in the audience that would like to speak before I read the email? Mr. Rowan, do you want, did you want to speak on the, I'm just calling him out. I'm sorry, Will. <laughs> ah. I thought you might. Okay, good. All right. Well, uh, you just have to unmute yourself. Yeah. Thanks. I just wanted to reiterate that that we did talk about this pretty extensively in the in the housing alliance meeting uh, two weeks ago, um, and that that you know there was overwhelming support as as was reiterated here. Um, there's a, there's a strong need in the community, and and really appreciate the uh, the you know care and and depth that you guys are looking. Uh, into um, with the analysis here. So um, I just wanted to, to pass on that level of support um, and again, uh, express appreciation for the consideration. Thanks, Will. Um, and I'll read the email. Bear with me, I have a lot of starred things here. This is from Mr. Donovan. He says, and I don't know his address, but I think we can find it. Uh, he says, the way that I look at this project, it's a winner for Scarborough any way you look at it. Senior affordable housing is the gold standard of housing from public officials' point of view. It meets an expressed community need. It does something good for those who need it. It's properly, if it's, it's properly located in this case and involves virtually no public costs, no school costs, no trash pickup, little likelihood of having to add safety or admin expenses. The, CE part, the CEA part, the 75% tax rate, reduction of a approximately $7 million building is the same as taxing a $1.75 million building at 100%. Um, since the taxes are almost all net tax revenues, it's a very productive use of property from a fiscal point of view. And I paraphrased a couple things there, so I apologize because he was writing directly to me, so I was trying to change a pronoun or two. Um, with that, we are, well, actually, first of all, guests, thank you. That was a two hour workshop. That was long. We do appreciate your time. Um, and I can tell you those answers are very thoughtful and very helpful. So I think we're all walking right away from this in a better place. So thank you. Okay, I have order number 2002, uh, sorry, excuse me, order number 2060 and act on a request for an executive session pursuant to title one of the MRSA 4056C regarding a personnel matter relating to the town manager's employment agreement not to come back to public session. Do I have a motion? Motion to, to adjourn and not to return. Yep, thank you. Do I have a second? Second. 
And before I call the vote, I think I'll have support in doing this. I will not, let's not meet in the executive session until 8.15. You guys want to take 15 solid minutes? Yeah. Do I have support doing that? Okay, you will get a Zoom link at about 8.12. Okay, so bear with me. I'm leaving for a little bit. Um, Tom, can you call the, Batch, did you have a question? Or are you just giving me the thumbs up? I couldn't tell. Okay, uh, thanks. Tom, can you call the vote? That's Councilor Gleistein. Yes. Councilor Hamill? Yes. Councilor Hayes? Yes. Councilor Johnson? Yes. Councilor Clucci? Yes. Chairman Johnson? Yes. Thank you. With that, we will uh, not be coming back to public session, and I will see five of you at 8.15. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Thank guys. Thank you. Thank you.